Hello, welcome to Renaissance FM. Today we have Richard McKenzie, one of uh, who was our guest uh, earlier this year. Um, hello, Richard. Hello, Stephanie. Welcome back to Renaissance FM. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me back. <laughs> <laughs> what's um, what, what's what's going on with you today? Why have you why have you come back here? Ah, uh, okay. Well, you asked me. <laughs> okay, you know when to say that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, well, well, it was uh, basically after doing a concert at the. Um, uh, Royal International Greenwich Festival of Early Music, yeah. um, which you which you came to on Thursday, and you were so fascinated by the instrument that I was playing that you asked me to come on the show. Yeah, there's an instrument. It's called the mandora, and it's um, forgive forgive us Renaissance fans and stuff. It's it, it's baroque. It's sort of is it late baroque? It's, um, it, it, it's sort of. Um, the main use for this instrument was between 1700 and 1800, and the peak use uh -huh. was during the time of uh, Johann Sebastian Bach and George Philip Telemann. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely Baroque, and on the later side of the Baroque. And it's, it's not shaped like a lute completely, is it? Like the, the peg box is uh, yeah. more sort of like... Was it ninety degrees sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. Not ninety degrees. I'm um, forty five degrees. Yeah, the peg box is. Um, <laughs> it's it, it. The rest of the instrument is quite like a Renaissance lute. It really, really is the Baroque re version of a Renaissance lute. Ah. But yeah, the peg box is very, very strange, and it's huge and cumbersome, and it and it stretches back, and it's overly elaborate, and just yeah, Baroque. And it's you, ornamental. You loved playing it, didn't you? It, it was an interesting experience playing it because um, it's not my instrument. I, I I don't own a mandora or a galashon. It has two names. It's one of those greedy instruments that has two names. <laughs> um, and uh, but um, James, uh, who built the instrument, James Marriage, he's a fantastic luthier, by the way. He asked me to perform with this instrument at the festival and I had uh, two weeks and six days in which to get used to playing the instrument and in which to craft a recital um, which was actually quite a hard feat um, oh. because I'd never played an instrument with that kind of string length before it's so 72 centimeters which is a very odd string length for Baroque my Baroque lute is about 68 and my Fiorbo is about 86 so it's sort of not it's not really anywhere it's not it's not it's wow. not like anything else that I play and uh, and the repertoire itself a lot of the repertoire it, there, there's some good stuff but there's there there's quite a lot of rubbish as well okay <laughs> well, we'll talk about that um, in seconds should we listen to the first piece or yeah yeah you've got a recording of it so I couldn't bring in the instrument today because um alas it, it isn't mine um apart but from the the air mandora it, oh, the air mandora yeah I was playing the air mandora just before practicing oh, that I was yeah. rocking it um but the uh, uh basically we recorded the concert on Thursday um using a Tascam and uh it's it's a little bit ambient um but you get you get a good idea of what's going on um, but um, lesson learned next time I'll record what, a bit closer this, miking. <laughs> what's the first piece that you're going to... Okay, the first piece is, it's only a minute and a half long and this was a prelude uh, by the Italian composer who worked at the um, Württemberg court um, uh, called uh, Brestianello. Brestianello. Brestianello, yeah, he's very obscure but it's a very pretty sort of Germanic uh, prelude. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ooh, that sounded that sounded lovely, as as it Thank was. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, can you tell me about that piece more? Yeah, um, uh, Brescianello. What, what was his full name? Uh, Giuseppe Antonio Brescianello. Um, yeah, he worked at the Wittenberg Court, but there's a possibility that there are a whole. Basically, there are a whole set of sonatas surviving by this guy in one manuscript in the Dresden Library. Um, but there is a possibility that these works were not, in fact, composed by him. Um, and they, they may, in fact, have been written by, well, by somebody else, possibly Straub. They, they struck me awfully like being like Straub's loop works. They're, they're very gallant and very Germanic. And most of Brescianello's music sounds like Vivaldi, to be honest. And that piece we just heard does not sound like Vivaldi oh. in any way, shape or form. So, yeah, that's interesting. Did you do the research for this music? Uh, yeah, in, in total, I managed to obtain copies of about 13 manuscripts, um, which, which had music that was relevant to the instrument. And uh, that, that's a lot of manuscripts to survey in a very, very short space of time. And uh, the funny thing is, Mandora is just like all the other kinds of lutes. I mean, you know about this. It's so messy. It gets so messy, like with a Renaissance lute, you get six courses, seven courses, all the way up to ten courses. Well, it's the same with the Mandora. So one of the manuscripts featured music for a nine-course Mandora. So a lot of the music that I played in this program is um, slightly rearranged for the seven-course Mandora uh, that James had given me in that specific tuning. Nothing so as to affect the instrument's, like, the, uh, the the quality of reproduction a, a huge amount although occasionally you will get kind of ambience which is in one tuning which wouldn't have been available in the tuning that I was utilising which is a shame but um, you know when you've only got one tuning to play with you're not going to spend half the concert tuning your instrument so what's it tuned to? It all the time. what is it tuned to Mandora? well it's basically it's tuned like a guitar Oh, that's why I didn't yeah. like it. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I tried to play it, and it was like, "What the?" Ah, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, no, it's yeah, it's tuned like a guitar, but it's it's a guitar in D, basically, oh. and it's a great big guitar it's in a D. Big stretch. Yeah, yeah, it's very big stretches. Uh, seven, yeah, I mentioned before, seventy-two centimeter string length, which really is long. It's a big guitar in D with an extra seventh course at the bottom. But it's French tablature, the actual music you're reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all of the surviving sources um, are in are in French tablature, no German or Italian tablature. Yeah, and French tablature is like letters, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Each Up, upside down from a normal tablature, like mm -hmm. oh, people understand. Uh, um, no, no, it's the Italians upside down. Italian tablatures upside down. French, French tablature is the same as like normal modern guitar tablature. It's, a, it's the right way up. Your top string is the top line. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So your top string at each line represents a string, and the bottom line is a bottom pitch string. The top line is a top pitch string, and uh, each letter represents a fret. So an A is an open string. B is to stop the first fret. C, you know, yeah, is. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're thanks, very good. Thanks for that. Pair. Thanks for that. That lute lesson. That's, <laughs> that's really helpful. <laughs> oh, okay. And what else yeah, have you been up to? Interesting. Do you want to talk about anything else, or is Mandora? There's so much to the Mandora, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what, what's the other piece that you had? That want in mind to play. Ah, okay. Well, um, well, we can talk about the composers for the Mandor if you like. Yes, composers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, who's uh, the newest and who's the oldest? Ah, uh, okay. Oh, well, that's the thing. I was after playing the concert. I was um, uh, sent more information by by a, a guy called Martin Hodgson, who's actually done a hell of a lot of research on the instrument, and who I who I owe a lot to. His, um, his um, advice was absolutely invaluable, and he sent me um, uh, more manuscripts cover covering later repertoire. But because I haven't had a chance to play them yet, I can't remember the name of the latest composer, oh. which is, which is a shame. But the music looks really pretty and quite useful, so it's a shame I didn't have that in time for this recital. I've always I would have played some of that, but um, other composers. Well, actually, quite a lot of the title of the program is aristocratic discourses. <coughs> it's a bit bit knobby. Aristocratic discourses. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit knobby, isn't what it? What a name! <laughs> who, who thought of that, Richard? Um, uh, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> regretfully. But no, it's it's called that because, um, well, because to be frank, a lot of aristocrats did write for the instrument and played the instrument. It was popular with the um, Central European aristocracy in the 18th century. And there's, there are actually <coughs> pieces surviving um, by these um, aristocratic composers for the instruments. And there, there are two of those composers were featured in this program. Ooh. Yeah, one of them was um, Jan Antonin Loggi, who was the Count of uh, Lozenfau. Um, he was uh, basically what is now the Czech Republic or Bohemia, but then the Kingdom of Bohemia. Ooh. Um, and, well, and so was he? Was he a good or a bad person? Um, by all accounts, he was a good person. Oh, that's just good. Just basically, just standard gentry landowner, music obsessed, played instruments all the time, and wrote lots of very. He was a very good composer. He wrote lots of very good music, and the other that's featured in this program is the actual Prince of Bavaria from this point. Very, very powerful man, Clemens Franz de Paula. Oh. And, uh, yeah, the uh, Prince von Bayern. And uh, he, he was a good prince by all accounts, but he's a very, very bad composer. Um, the whole manuscript is dross, uh, with the exception of this one piece, which was uh, from, from a sonata in F major. It's the first movement of a sonata in F major, the second one in the surviving manuscript, which is actually quite pretty. So um, would, would you like to hear it? Um, yeah, 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 Aristotle. What's it called? Discourses. Yeah. When, when, I, when, I, when I hear the word aristocrats, I think of um, Aristocats. <laughs> yeah. The Disney film. That's very, very cute. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, the Allegro. so fun that one and I remember I remember when you were playing it and you were like dancing when you were playing it weren't you <laughs> you're just like going wee, wee. Yeah, I definitely I definitely got into it um, especially when he plays with pauses and a couple of places and a pretty little interrupted cadences and yeah it's a pretty piece so why do you like that piece it's fun isn't it oh it's just great fun and it's a catchy melody and it's it's well constructed and it's a miniature of course but yeah it's it's a good fun miniature and it's a best thing by the Prince of Bavaria in the whole manuscript by is, far is it to do with the intervals like this sort of between each note <laughs> oh well, it's yeah. I I, I, Music. I I like I like the harmony of the piece and tonally it was very very sim simply constructed. It's a simple piece but a good piece. It's like it's like a what, what, what's a good. It's it's like really really good food that's simple and made from simple ingredients. It's satisfying Pasta. but not complicated. Yeah, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I had a very very good cheese and tomato toasty yesterday, which was just bread, cheese and tomato. But it worked perfectly because all the ingredients were oh, were, I ha I had were that really this high morning. quality. With there ham we go. in it. There we go. <laughs> Actually, it was a croissant. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, but um, but what what do you think the, these um, people who were like aristocratic people playing this instrument were mm-hmm. doing when they weren't playing their mandora? Were they were they like uh, doing bad things? Uh, oh well, affairs of state, um, uh, dealing dealing with legal paperwork, probably out hunting is a pastime. Hunting, time. yeah, that's what they did, didn't if they? If they were randy, they'd have mistresses because um, <laughs> you yeah. can afford that. <laughs> but um, yeah, or smoking. Well, s- smoking actually, uh, tobacco smoking was becoming more popular by this point. Yeah, yeah, most definitely was becoming a lot more common. So. We're, we're trying to vo- avoid talking about anything dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that was really fun. That one. Um, and and also, what's the next bit? That? Well, a lot a lot of the pieces in the in in the program were anonymous. Oh, my favourite so. composer. Anonymous, Anon- yeah, yeah, yes. Anony Mouse. Um, yes, I think that's a bad <laughs> joke. Um, but um, and yeah, the the next piece uh, um, that, that I'd like to play is by an anonymous composer. It's from this awesome manuscript, but it's a great big adagio. Where did you um, find it? God knows who wrote it. It's in it's in a uh, manuscript that's currently in the Czech Republic, oh. and uh, I made a scan of it from a microfilm. And it, this is a beautiful piece of music and a really, really good find. Um, but yeah, as currently it's anonymous, but I'm sure with adequate research over the course of a year and record finding, you could probably attribute a composer. But I can't, I can't even begin to at the moment. And, and you really enjoy playing it? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant piece of music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow. Wake up. Wake up, everyone. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> All right. Well, um, that was really lovely. Um, very, very sort of mellow and stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. Very, very mellow. It's yeah. quite a hard piece as well because the left hand is forever shooting. Sh- it's shooting about all about on that instrument. Yeah, it's like mm. going, going up and down like stairs. Woo. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. Well, all anyway, enough enough of this um, Mandora riffraff. Um, <laughs> well, actually, not Mandora, but, you know, Baroque, Baroque. Um, let's have some Renaissance. Um, did you have any Renaissance pieces in this Yeah, there, there, there are a couple of pieces which, um, which were derived from Renaissance models, which is good. And it's good to see them continuing all the way into like the 1740s which is the period that's sort of, sort of mean time period of this program and and there are there are two pieces um uh, which really really were quite renaissance based um the first um you'll hear them in order at the end of the program the first was called a, a faber which very very strange title for a piece don't know what it means oh. um but it's um but it features a whole second section which is lifted uh, from a dance piece by Pretorius, who published in the 1610s. It's really, really random. Yeah, and it's lifted from a Renaissance dance piece. So, yeah, that's that's very strange, and it's approximately 130 years out of date. Um, oh. So that's very, very odd. Who played that? Um, uh, well, uh, it, was, it was me who's playing it, but the composer... Lord knows, it's another, it's another a nonny mouse. Yeah, oh. Lord knows who composed that. Where from? And it's oh, it's from a manuscript from the same manuscript as the piece that we've just heard. Um, Czech manuscript two seven point seven five zero. Yeah, it's um, same same manuscript. So very interesting manuscript. But Lord knows who composed what's in it. And people uh, dance to it. Uh, yeah, you can one. dance to the Faber. Um, the Faber seems to be it, it. seems to be based on folk music models, and yeah, it's it's all about dance. And the second, the second piece, and it's um, Renaissance sort of more. Yeah, yeah. The okay. second and the second piece, it's more. Ooh, well done. Um, sorry. Uh, the second piece, it's more Renaissance, is a uh, um, is a folia. Um, it's actually it's, it's, it says here in the manuscript it's spelled foglio di Spagna, which is sort of, leaf. Um, so it's oh. a bit <laughs> leaf of Spain, but no, really, it's just corrupt. It is. It means it's folia, which is a very very common. Uh, ground base. It's first sighted in about 1470, and there are loads and loads of Renaissance settings. And it was known in Italy as the um, in the 1550s as a uh, Catacossa um, on the continent. It's a Catacossa. And, what does that uh, mean? To be frank, I don't know. Oh. I've never looked it up. I should look that. That's naughty of me. Yeah, I, your, your I brains. You can absorb lots mm. of information. You, mm. you could. Well, like, useless information. Just pick, pick, <laughs> pick up your air man door you just knocked over on the floor. Yep. Right. Pick it up. I'm picking it up. Okay. <laughs> well done. Well done. I'll rock the air man door again. <laughs> but no, it's um yeah. So the folly era was a ground base on on which was composed for hundreds and hundreds of years. So yeah, that's that's very very renaissancey as well. Those are two main renaissancey pieces. So, so who played what? They actually played that and on the mandora at the time. Yeah, all, all the baroque guitar. That piece, um, this version of the folie seems to fit both instruments very, very well. So yeah, it's, it's um, and the manuscript clearly states guitar or um, or mandora. Okay. So um, right then. Awesome. Should, well, should, should we listen to what's the next piece called again? Um, it's a Faber, Faber you said, and yeah. then a folie. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. 
that's lovely, lovely. That's um, made make me cry. That one. Um, thanks, Richard, for coming on the show. Maybe, maybe we'll have you on the show again. Maybe. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's cool. been a pleasure. Thank awesome. you for inviting me. Brilliant. Well done. Well done. Bringing the man- Mandora back. Um, and we'll have Ben Hebert is going to be on the show next week, guys. So um, so um, I'll see you next week. Bye.